after almost 40 episodes, editing can be a very tedious task, even for those that shocker went to film school for it. Never thought I used those skills, but here we are. Anywho, check out the program Descript, D-E-S-C-R-I-P-T. It's going to take your editing to the next level. Essentially, you upload your audio and or video. It transcribes it and you can edit how you would edit a Word document. All the same great features of other editing software is in there. You can add graphics, text, but it also does word finds for those common filler words like your us, ums, likes. And at the click of a button, they vanish. You can delete everything in one bulk selection. It is amazing. Has streamlined my editing, given me time back in my week. I can't recommend this program more highly. The subscription fee is well worth the money in my opinion. So if you are interested in taking advantage, we have an affiliate code on our link tree and our socials. And so please check it out. Welcome to the No More Late Fees podcast. I'm Danielle. And I'm Jackie. And we're just two best friends and ex blockbuster employees rewatching some of the best and worst movies from the late 90s and early 2000s. Five, four, three, two, one. Happy New, New Year. Year. <laughs> this week, we're ringing in 2022 with the 1999 film 200 Cigarettes. This ensemble comedy follows an array of young people in New York City on New Year's Eve, 1981, looking for love and hilarious places. It stars Christina Ricci, Paul Rudd, Kate Hudson, Ben Affleck, Gabby Hoffman, Guillermo Diaz, Casey Affleck, Dave Chappelle, Courtney Love, Jay Moore, Martha Plimpton, Angela Featherstone, Nicole Ari Parker, and still more. There's still more, but had to give them all a shout out. The movie was written by Shana Larson. I hope it's Shana and not Shauna. It could be Shauna. Not sure. And the, it was directed by Risa Brayman Garcia. Where can you find it? Well, peeps, DVD. Unfortunately, it is not streaming anywhere. It is a crime against humanity. Apparently, it, re- it received some negative reviews and has gone out of print. But I just checked, actually copies of this movie on dvd were going for almost like 200 dollars on ebay but recently it just got restocked and went into reprint and i bought you your own copy jackie what merry christmas thank you (laughs) so thank god i didn't pay 200 dollars. it's like 16 bucks on amazon so thank god yeah and for you guys, if you want to watch it, it's on Amazon. So. <laughs> but not streaming. You have not. to buy. You have to have a device in which to put a disc in to watch. Yes, it. <laughs> yes, a hundred percent. But before we get started, let's get into our ratings rewind. So you know the drill. Before we get into the movie, we'll reveal the rating our Y two K versions of ourselves would give. Then at the end, we'll see if our current selves agree with our initial rating. Our scale consists of, would buy it, would buy it again. The best would play on repeat. Five-day rental. Would watch again. Two-day rental. Okay, but nothing to write home about. And same-day rental. Get those glad bags ready, because this is trash. So Danielle, what is your YTK rating? <laughs> Clearly it's would buy, would buy it again. Cause guess what? When I bought your copy, a bitch bought one for herself. <laughs> Same. I own this. And then I did the great DVD purging of like 2012 and I got rid of all my DVDs, but I will be happy to have this one back since it is not streaming anywhere. Oh, so this movie, its budget was $6 million. It made $6.8 million. 
And, you know, I try to read some articles. There wasn't a lot of fun movie facts on this one. The director, she doesn't know why it's not streaming. It's been asked of her a few times. She's not really sure what the problem is. I personally thought it was the music because this from the beginning to the end, it's filled with a lot of 80s bangers. The music guides the movie. It, yeah. it, it is like a um, secondary character all throughout the movie. And <clears throat> what I read was Elvis Costello has a cameo in this movie and yeah. he was instrumental in getting a lot of those titles and suggesting songs by some indie artists and stuff. And so he, I think was really the one that was able to get so many hits into this movie without there being a huge cost associated. Yeah. Well, I, I just, then I don't, I don't know to speak to what you were saying about Elvis Costello, the first time producer, Betsy Beers, she was a huge Elvis Costello fan she told him on set that Imperial Bedroom was her favorite album. And that's what like clicked this relationship for him. He said he was pleasantly surprised and told her no one ever mentions that album. So he became instrumental in securing the rights to the songs that they would have never afforded with their limited budget. And he even recommended little known artists that characters would likely be listening to in 1981. Another great thing about this movie is that they're celebrating the year of our birth, <laughs> like, like going into our the year of our birth. It's like they're celebrating us. A hundred percent. I just, I love that for us. And I think it was a perfect New Year's to do this movie because if your math is math and we will be celebrating some big birthdays coming up. Why, Jesus, why you leave your straightest <laughs> way? That's right, people. Jackie and I are going into our 40s. The only thing that brings me solace is that we don't look 40. So, and we won't look 40 ever. So this movie, we're going to tackle a little bit differently than most of our movies because... It's all it over is the one place. of the, it is all over the place and it's a lot of different scenes, different settings and then like the characters within those settings cross paths multiple times and then end up at the same location at the end of the movie. <laughs> one of the other great things about this movie so the director does talk about how this movie was a flop but she thinks one of the reasons it was the way that they decided to market the movie because it had so many up and comers in, in here. Like I think Kate Hudson hadn't done very much. We've got Ben Affleck, Casey Affleck, you know, they were all pretty big names at that time. And Christina Ricci for sure. She 100%. had been actress, acting since she was a child. These were big um, names. They what my sister-in-law referred to this cast as when I kind of read her who was in the movie mm -hmm. was like the nineties version of the Brat Pack. Mm. Like it was all of those actors and actresses that were household names by that point. Yeah. I was, I was wondering, cause I didn't prep the notes. So you did. I, the whole movie I sat and I was like, a woman had to have hands on this movie. Yep. Like there is no way like the, the Tyra Janine Gar Garofalo goes on about in the men, cab, yeah. <laughs> just the way the, the female characters interact, the way Kate Hudson's character is so vulnerable and wanting to please so badly. Like it, it just, it all. And how the men, how the male characters are written as well just a, a little aloof some yes. of them are misogynistic yeah but it, it's not like the whole movie's wrapped around them it's no. from a lens of we know that they're fucking idiots there's yeah. a, an entire plot line of a man who can't please a woman sexually and he goes on tirades about how it's really the women's fault so yeah yeah a hundred percent 
this the writer is amazing um and this is the directorial debut of Risa so yeah you have a female writer and a female director it was great and back to her saying why the movie was a flop is that you had all these big dad actors and that's how they were marketing it as if it was going to be this huge movie and this is an indie this was an yeah. indie movie and it did not need that kind of like you don't need the masses to come to this because the masses aren't necessarily ready for this kind of story so it got panned the reviews were scathing And I think it's important for us to reflect back on some of these movies, because if we're having issues with getting more diversity in the reviewers that are seeing movies now, could you imagine what it was like in the 90s and the early aughts? It was bad. If you look back, I dare you to find me a review that was bad, that was female. Yeah. Because everything I saw were male. Yeah. Reviews. I will say other than like, background characters there wasn't aside from Dave Chappelle a whole lot of diversity we had Guillermo um but he does say anything he doesn't say a word he doesn't say a word and he's so heavily like his hair is dyed these crazy colors and stuff and very long and almost covering his face where it, it's really an ambiguous character as to their ethnicity like yeah. you could have and we so had Nicole Ari Parker as well, which yes. was great. So you had, I mean, con- comparatively to some of the other movies we've seen, it had a little bit more diversity. Yeah, than but at most. the same time, it's in the middle of New York City. Like there should right. have been a lot more than it was. <laughs> so I do, so, do want to say this. So what we've been seeing lately with the new Gossip Girl and Sex in the City you have the shows where when they were made in the 2000s that had zero diversity and there was a lot of, you know, discourse about how are you in New York City and you don't have any diversity whatsoever. The problem is when you live in New York City, people have their groups and their cliques. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, especially when they're like really rich, they don't have diversity in those areas. So having these TV shows and these movies not reflecting that's what's real Mm -hmm. it actually makes it not that I'm pushing for a lack of diversity but I don't get upset about it as much because white people be white peopling I don't I don't know what to say well and even in like the different neighborhoods in in the boroughs like you have your your Puerto Rican neighborhood you have your Italian neighborhood like they and that's who you hang out and grow up with it can be very, like New York is very diverse, yeah. but it could be very segregated at the same time. Yeah. So when I saw this movie in the eighties, I was like, it's real. Like I, yeah. I could go back to when my mom was growing up and the only settings in which she probably had a more diverse group of friends was at co- in school or at mm-hmm. work, but her yeah. core group, she was hanging with black people. And so Eh. usually I'm, I'm calling for more diversity to make sense this one I'm just like eh. it's it Martha Plimpton's character especially that art scene that they were in yeah because all of those people were kind of from the art scene that segregation makes a lot of sense to me yeah but I don't know so Dave Chappelle's character he plays a cab driver And so he interacts with almost every subsect of character groups along the way. So he's kind of like that thread until the end of the movie that kind of links them together other than them happen to be in the same setting at the same time. Mm -hmm. So he has his Afro and his (laughs) leisure suit, little disco ball in the, on the rear view mirror. And He, he could fall into the magical Negro stigma not stigma but a uh, trope if you would call it where he's giving the advice and he's kind of you know he has his own role but it's really in service to all of these um yes. white people so that um, I can call out for sure you few takeaways from Dave Chappelle's character <laughs> I want to create a line of like inspirational posters 
from all of the advice he gives throughout the movie because some of the shit he says <laughs> is fucking hilarious. He has what, the three. I I, I I wrote them down. Okay. Here we go. His rules for for women, I guess. No. Smile a lot. <laughs> Smile, baby. Don't talk about death. And music makes the booty spin round. <laughs> and as he's explaining that, he says, this is how you're going to get to booty right here. Because music makes the booty spin round. <laughs> and so in the scene, so we'll, we're going to start off with Paul Rudd. And, and I'm not going to give the names. Oh. It's just too, it's too crazy. So yeah. we have Paul Rudd it's, and Courtney Love. And we will use Dave Chappelle's character to move along to the other subset of groups. So he is having this conversation with Paul Rudd. The faces that Paul Rudd makes in this, in all the scenes, but especially in this scene, it's crazy. And his sideburns are like what mutton chops, mutton chops, yeah. but they're not mutton chops. They're triangular mutton chops usually mutton chops are really rounded yeah. these are triangular like <laughs> comes to like the corner of his mouth like his whole look is crazy and his <laughs> act, his acting is chaotic but I feel like one of the most amazing Paul Rudd performances it is so <laughs> Paul Rudd yeah that I was just eating it up like every scene he's in I'm just like <laughs> What crazy shit are you going to do next? What's he, you doing, Paul Rudd? He's just like grumpy bear from Care Bears. Just a cloud over his head. He is mean and just visceral, just horrible. So so we, we learn quickly that his girlfriend broke up with him yesterday. Played by um, Janine Garofalo. Yes. And that New Year's Eve is his birthday. Uh, December 31st is his birthday. And so... Courtney Love is kind of the, the, I don't know why you're all so pissy. And he's like, you make me go out. And he's like, she's like, it's, it's your birthday. Like, I don't get it. And then like, he's always, he has to complain about something. And sometimes she'll like solve the problem he's complaining about. And then he but just he pivots to something else. He doesn't else. want it solved. He wants no. to be upset. Yeah. So I don't know how you felt about Courtney Love playing this role. I think when I originally watched it, you know, I used to watch this quite a bit, actually. I did not mind her then. I don't mind her now. I think like the what I imagined her to be or her, her celebrity persona, let's say what we, what we see as Courtney Love, like on the red carpet and stuff, I feel like it was just this character. Like, I felt like this character was written for her and was essentially just supposed to be Courtney Love being Courtney Love. Really? Because it just yeah. was her being this overly saccharine sweet person and it just didn't. I don't but know. But she wasn't sweet all the time. There were points when she was like, fuck off. I'm I'm going to leave you. Like, like if you're going to be like this, I'm just, I'm out. Yeah. Those felt more authentic. It's the parts where she was trying to be the, I don't know. Apparently she wanted the role the movie to be a little bit edgier so did Janine Garofalo but I don't know I just I don't like Courtney Love I guess I'll just say that that's fine I as an actress yeah I I mean I I enjoyed her in this role like even Y2K and current Jackie like the little touches that she did like there's one part one part where she is walking away from him they've had an argument and he says, fuck you or something. And she like <laughs> flips him off and then like lifts up her jacket and shows him her yeah. ass, <laughs> like things like that. I'm like, it, it's so subtle, like, but brilliant. Like the, that physical element where she's not turning around and screaming as she's walking down the street. Like, she's just like, she's done. Yeah, that was Courtney. That was Courtney love. That was yeah. the other parts when she was like, I just felt like she was acting. And she's not good at it. So that's when it, but the other, there were, there were glimpses of genius and those glimpses yeah. were just her being her. Yeah. But following their journey, they go to a bar and that's when we meet Ben Affleck. He's a bartender and he's, she's trying to flirt with him or whatever. 
uh, there's a there's a seed or she's giving him the address to this party so all of the characters are trying to get to this party or their final destination is going to this party and so she's writing down the address for him and she's like yeah, she pretty much says <laughs> that yeah we're you know I'm going we'll be together and then she points to Paul Rudd and so it's like she ruins this opportunity because the you could see in Ben Affleck the bartender's face that he's he he's turned off but because it feels like they're together yeah which self-sabotage because clearly she's in love with her best friend and all he's doing is bitching about his ex-girlfriend and everything else in between so I just that that interaction made me laugh because I could see myself doing something fucking stupid like that and I I just want to return to the cab ride real fast because (laughs) Paul Rudd is like in his like in his feelings but the shit he says he (laughs) says at one point we as a people are one and we enjoy various kinds of food like I'm like What? what what are we talking about? Like what? That Existential like, crisis are we going through right now, Paul Rudd? And let me help you through your journey. <laughs> and like, they were not, they were in a cab. They were not eating food. They were <laughs> like, it was such a bizarre, that weird and wonderful Paul Rudd where I'm like, that was fucking ad libbed. And they were I just like, great. Let's go more Paul Rudd, please. I wonder um, how much of the script did he actually read or he actually said because I feel like 90% of this role was ad-libbed I'm here for it (laughs) all day every day so yes continuing on with Courtney Love and Paul Red's character they they leave the bar at some point because she keeps on talking about how you know he should get laid for his it's his birthday and then she also goes into this whole thing about he doesn't find her attractive and he's like what and so she's like if you do then let's have sex and so what I also think is hilarious is that they leave the bar to go to the coffee shop and use the bathroom there to have sex and not the bar's bathroom but they were in the they were eating in the diner I thought they were talking about sex at the bar but I could be wrong let me see. Lucy is drunk at the bar. We're on B. No, they leave the bar. They're walking down the street. And so after the bartender is kind of like, oh, wait, she is very disheartened and they end up leaving. Yeah. And so they're walking down the street. That's when Paul Rudd sees the posters of Janine Garofalo, his ex-girlfriend's show and he's like he says something about like they put them here on purpose so I would see them (laughs) like that is something like that is something someone would say like if they were in their feels (laughs) so then they're also Oh, this is when she starts talking to him about how he should have sex because it's his birthday, blah, blah, blah. Gotcha. Elvis Costello just randomly like walks by them. Nobody notices by them. Yeah. But Jackie noticed. And then (laughs) at one point she's like, are you offering yourself to me? And, (laughs) and then she's like, oh, and I guess he, he says no or something. And she's like, oh, so you think I'm ugly? She always goes to that very self-deprecating. I wanted to say, yeah. And then what are you going to say? Could you stop with this? (laughs) And then he, but he responds and he says, you know, I don't have ugly people as friends. (laughs) Is that the barometer? He does not answer the question. He does not. But I, I hate when people do that, like fishing for compliments, I guess. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. And so after this, they're now at the diner and they're having a conversation about how Courtney Love's character has fucked many men. And, and then somehow it devolves into Paul Red's ex-girlfriend having sex with Jack, whoever the fuck Jack is. And so then 
that's kind of when he was like, he was lamenting about his girlfriend and still wanting to be back with her. And then he finds out that she cheated on him. And so he pivots to the, okay, if you want to have sex, let's have sex. Right. Um, now his brain is mad and he wants to get back at his ex-girlfriend. Exactly. And so they go, they hit, they hit the bathroom up and this scene. Wait, before, before that happens, Mm -hmm. I wrote Lucy is sick of Kevin shit. That's their characters names. She's going to the party. And then he has this weird existential crisis where he's standing up in the middle of like the the walkway for the diner he's just kind of writhing around and then he like puts his hand on a bald man's face that's like sitting at the counter and the man just turns around and kind of like pats him on the shoulder and then turns back to his <laughs> I'm like just the physical acting alone <laughs> oh, I just love Paul Rudd so much but yes so now they're back uh, after that scene we find out that they've been friends for five years and finally they're like, do you want to fuck? You don't think I'm serious. You don't think I'm attracted to you. It's um, the weirdest. I, I, I start to hate them so much because I'm just like, what is wrong with these two? And his respond. Uh, so Courtney Love's character says, you don't think I'm attracted to you. Paul Rudd responds. I don't think you're attracted to half the people you sleep with. And she immediately says, you think I'm a slut, which he replies, stanky little hoe, maybe, but never a slut. (laughs) And then she dares him to fuck her. Yet she still wants to sleep. They're crazy. So then they go into the bathroom. And in this scene, I've never seen people take their clothes off more awkwardly. And more. She has a dress on. Like it should have been pants unzipped, dress hiked up to her. Right. Waist. Why are we unzipping in the bathroom? This is why are we a- taking his shirt off? This is right. down and dirty sex. Right. I'm glad we know what the <laughs> there was scenario. way too much. He was very appreciative of her boobs, though. Like yes. he had just noticed she had boobs for the first time. I can't. And she, uh, the part where she elbows him in the face is more like an elbow swipe. Like <laughs> it is, as they're going through this drama, you hear someone else come in, they're laughing about it until they find out it's Janine Garofalo, his girlfriend, ex girlfriend, yes. saying, I see you. And those are the shoes I bought you. So don't act like it's not you. And they open the door and she's like, Of course. And so, he completely leaves Courtney Love's character and is he's like, it's a baby, please, baby, please moment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, please forgive me. She's like, I was just gonna, I just left you a message. And which really ties into the fact that we didn't, you know, there was no cell phone, so he didn't get it in the moment. And he she wanted to move her. back in. Yeah. And like she up. had a she had a moment of weakness and broke up with him, <laughs> but she she wants to make up. And then he's like, but you slept with Jack. And she's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And then he like looks at Courtney Love and she's just like, sabotage. Maybe, maybe I was wrong. I got it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so he's furious The and he leaves her, but Janine Garofalo's character walks off and then they have it out in the middle of the the coffee bar yelling at each other pretty much yes and now Courtney Love's character is like you can go fuck yourself and this is the scene when the, he's like chasing after her and she lifts her dress up and he yeah tells him. she said she's going back to the bar to get the bartender exactly <laughs> and so she gets the bar get back to the bartender or whatever and here he comes later I don't know if he goes anywhere else in between, but I don't think so. He comes. Well, so the- we, we cut to Janine Garofalo is in, now in Dave Chappelle's cab. Right. And she storms off and she rants a lot. I, I have a little excerpt of her ranting. <laughs> Men, they are so similar in their mediocrity. And then 
my favorite line of the whole movie. She's trying to light a cigarette with matches and she goes, these matches are disappointing me. (laughs) I just love it so much. And then once Dave Chappelle lights her cigarette for her, she continues on. Or he he says, here you go, baby. And she says, I, <laughs> I, I can't be baby, but thank you. That's courtesy. Courtesy and manners are what women know. The woman is so willing to sublimate her needs to guide her man through the important signposts of life lovingly, <laughs> very lovingly. And then Dave Chappelle hits on her and she's like, this corner is great. Just, just let me out. <laughs> Like he has he, not listened to a single nope. word she said. He, he thinks that she wants to pull over to for a little nightcap and she's yeah. like, I'm getting it. But I, I, all I questioned was, did she pay for the ride? I don't think so. And then he goes, I must not have been smiling. That's <laughs> was, what it was. That's what it was. That was what the, the thing that turned her off. <laughs> Fast forward and then they're, then uh, they're back at the bar mm-hmm. all red and Courtney love he comes back to win her over he has bought two I want to say bushels instead <laughs> <laughs> two bushels of flowers and they're arguing and whatnot but she, does she leave with him or does she leave him at the no, bar they say let's go back to the diner because they're back on the fucking train. right yeah <laughs> but go. this is when they're like instead of just doing it in the dirty bar bathroom they go back to the diner <laughs> just to have <laughs> dirty diner bathroom sex and it makes is, no sense and this is when Courtney love reals, realizes that she doesn't want to just have sex with him like dirty sex and he's like wait a minute wait the fuck all these men that you slept with and now it's gotten to me this yeah. moment you decide you don't want to have sex and so they start arguing and again again well because what she says is she realized she can't continue having sex with people that don't care about her and he's like all the meaningless sex you've had so far and you're coming to this realization with me your friend of five years like it does not compute right he's not getting that what she really means is that she wants to have meaningful relations with him not yes. every other guy but he's so stupid he's not getting it and then the, this is when they scream and yell at each other in the middle of the diner <laughs> and then so she storms off he storms off but they both end up th- at the party at the party together. yeah yeah they end up at the party you see she comes from around the corner and she sees that he's with Janine Garofalo, Mm -hmm. even though they had just met up accidentally, like they weren't together. So she's misreading the whole thing. And one of the most disappointing things about this movie is that we don't get to experience the party. Yes. Um, (laughs) We experience the party the way Martha Plimpton's character experiences the party, (laughs) which we'll get into later. (laughs) So they pretty much fast forward to the end and you you see everyone's coupled off at the end of the movie pretty much for the, with the exception of Martha Plimpton Plimpton and Gabby Hoffman's character mm-hmm. even Guillermo finds a girl on the couch so that's like a whole another <laughs> thing so yes at the very end you see them they're waking up um together in bed and then Paul Rudd's character has this conversation about how there were studies done that the reason why people smoke is it, it because it disassociates them from other people. They like have more a- attention paid to their cigarette than the other people around them. And so at the very end of that scene, he said, I'm going to quit smoking because obviously he wants to be fully invested in her. And let me say for the record that this movie had so much cigarette smoking. I'm actually surprised that at, in 99, this was allowed at this point. Yeah. Me being the former president of student tobacco reform initiative, knowledge for eternity. I do have to say <laughs> <laughs> that I don't support this in any way. And I trigger warning a lot of smoking in this movie. But in all fairness, the movie's title is 200 Cigarettes. So if you didn't know going in, I don't know what to tell you. And 200 Cigarettes is a reference to a carton of cigarettes. 
Uh, that's how many cigarettes are in a general carton of cigarettes. So the more you know. Okay, who are we following next? Oh, let's follow Christina Ricci and Gabby Hoffman. <laughs> so they're from Long Island. And they definitely have they're not accent. used to the big city. No, they're well, I they, I don't know if you I guess it's for their bridge and tunnel girls. Yes, I believe that is what I read somewhere. <laughs> And so Gabby Hoffman is scared of everything because it's the oh city. Oh my God. She annoyed the shit out of me oh, in this movie. She's such a fucking whiner baby. <laughs> so she is terrified of everything. They're in Alphabet City, which Danielle, can you elaborate on what Alphabet City is? Because <laughs> I only know what I know from this movie. Okay. So by the time that I was living it up in New York, Alphabet City was a lot cleaner and safer but that's not to say I was roaming these streets, but I wasn't trying. I wasn't going past A on at <laughs> night. So when she was having that real fear of B, a hundred, I was like, girl, I get it. Cause you get raped on B. <laughs> that, that's what she said. But yes, you can also get mugged, stabbed, killed, all sorts of wonderful things. And it, you know, it's not exclusive, just <laughs> that area it just it's darker over there like I was like do we not have lights what's happening but it, it was really cool being able to go to the avenues at that time going clubbing and stuff because a lot of the same places like there's this club called pyramid where Madonna back in the 80s used to perform so there's still some there's a lot of dive bars in that area that mm-hmm. have been around forever I hate to even say it because I know probably through the pandemic, a lot of them probably aren't existing anymore, but boy, oh boy, do we have fun. I also had a huge eighties phase in my early twenties. So I enjoyed that little bit of history. I love dressing up like eighties style and going to the fake clubs and in the avenues, A, B, and C's over there. Some fun bars, good times. (laughs) But they were accurate. And the fact that they were able to film in 99, they didn't have to change anything except the cars. Because <laughs> <laughs> everything looks the fucking the same. So, And so they're trying to get to Christina Ricci's cousin's party. So Martha Plimpton's party. And she has, she wrote down the address on like a scrap of magazine paper. Like it, it was like this tiniest little scrap and she wrote it down wrong. And so now they're lost in Alphabet City. Gabby Hoffman's having a fit. I would be mad too. I'm not going to that part. I would be mad at. And like Christina Ricci has this giant purse and she's like, well, and I think she's looking for a dime to call from a payphone to find out where her cousin actually lives. And she's like, I don't have any money. And Gabby Hoffman's character is just like, what the fuck are you carrying in there? And she's like, (laughs) makeup and shit. And she's like, well, we got a ton of fucking makeup and no address and we're lost in Alphabet City. And so then we see them crossing to Avenue B and um, just prior to this, Gabby Hoffman <laughs> yells at her, call your mother, get the address from your mother. She has to have it. And, and Christina Reese, she's just like, I can't call my mother. She thinks I'm sleeping at your house. <laughs> like, they're just arguing. Oh, and can we talk about their fits? Yes. Oh, before we talk about that, I do want to preface that when I'm talking about as Avenue A, and bees or whatever i'm taught we're down in the the lower east side area lower well now we're in the west side so just we're below 14th street when i'm talking about the avenues i don't want people uh to get all pissy with me so i can t- sorry continue you're fine so now they're crossing b and Gabby Hoffman is not crossing the street. She's like, I'm not going over there. I'm not about to get killed today. And <laughs> Christina Ricci's like, well, she's going to call a mother. 
And so she's walking down the street and these guys with a boom box are like walking down the street. Christina Ricci just like doesn't pay him any attention, walks right through them. And I do want to, sp- to specify that these men walking that she was terrified of were black men yeah. holding boom boxes, not concerned with her whatsoever. They, um, they say hi as they're walking by. It's not in a menacing way. It's not in a like, hey girl way. It's just like, hey, as they're walking by. But Gabby Hoffman is fucking terrified because she has now crossed the street <laughs> and has walked through this gang of men, apparently in her eyes that she yes. might be raped or killed. And so she hurries up to catch up to Christina Ricci. So what they are wearing though, Christina Ricci is in budget Cruella de Vil coat. <laughs> I think I have that jacket at my house. And you saw it hanging in the, ba- the bedroom you were in. And then a red dress. What color were her shoes? Wow. I don't remember. So she's, she's in uh, red, white, and bl- um, black. Um, and her hair is all done almost like in a pinup style. She has blonde hair in this movie. It's kind of done in a pinup style. And then Gabby Hoffman. That outfit is all over the place. So she is wearing um, this knit, like patchwork sweater, but it has like this weird pocket where like pearls are falling out of it with a like embroidered crochet rose on it. And then under that, she has like this, orange and purple turtleneck it's it's a lot we do have to give thumbs up to susan lyle who was the costume designer and guess what movie she also was the costume designer on jackie i i know only because i read the the notes never mind then empire (laughs) records you say yes you're correct and then she has this like ruffled skirt with hot pink fishnet pantyhose and I want to say some sort of high top sneaker it's it's a look yeah there's a lot of looks in this movie and they're fun Uh, they are I think caricatures of 80s fashion in a sense because I don't think I could see anybody actually wearing and you know that's saying a lot because the 80s was kind of crazy Again, she was really annoying, her character, Gabby Hoffman, (laughs) but I do want to give her, I I do want to say that it was warranted. The streets of New York and what we know it now were so scary, so Mm -hmm. filled with drugs, so dangerous. It was a different time. Mean streets. (laughs) (laughs) So now they're trying to find a payphone. So they go into this punk club. Mother is not answering. She must be out out in the streets. (laughs) And for some reason, they were going to meet this band before going to the party. And and then Gabby Hoffman realizes there was never a band. It was just to get her to leave Long Island for the night. And, and, and so Gabby Hoffman is like, you lied to me. You lied to me. And Christina Ricci is like, I didn't lie. My cousin's having a party. I just <laughs> need the address. <laughs> so but like, she did lie though. Yes. <laughs> it's to no get her. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then Gabby Hoffman starts spiraling and she's like, we don't belong in there. We don't belong on B. And then there's <laughs> these two guys following them. And so they're in a panic. And I don't know why Casey Affleck and Guillermo Diaz just look so fucking creepy. Like they're just stalking them. That's all there is to it. It it was really stalking them. That I agree. It was weird. And Casey Affleck just looks so out of place in his clothes. Like he doesn't normally wear that. He couldn't even pull it off. Guillermo Diaz was in his bag, but uh, yeah. Casey Affleck, it was just like eyeliner and a leather jacket does not a punk make. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> but so we quickly find out it's Casey Affleck's character and his uh, friend played by Guillermo Diaz. Guillermo Diaz, head to toe, like he had like plaid pants, like a weird shirt. His hair was two tone, like on the bottom it was it was dark, but then on the top it was like this at home manic panic orange that like was like fading out and at first he's just eating what looks like a hot dog or a sandwich (laughs) but then he has beer in his jacket and at first I was like is this a silent bob situation is he just not going to talk because Casey Affleck was talking for him like his character was all over the place but I was here for it much more so than Casey Affleck's character well he's trash I I do want to give this (laughs) <laughs> just a PSA there are at times we're watching movies or we're going to do a movie and it has people that are trash in human form that we don't support per se this is an ensemble situation so it's a little different and we do take his allegations very seriously even yes. though they're alleged I still think he's a trash human being yeah. personally my opinion But one of my favorite stories, speaking on Guillermo Diaz, is that just from doing the research, I really enjoyed this one. So apparently one of the other actresses, Angela Featherstone, who plays another character we haven't gotten to yet, she rapped before they had time to film a shot of her driving away in the cab. So one of the producers said, like, you can do my hair. And Guillermo said, I'll do it. (laughs) (laughs) Because his hair was so weird and crazy. So they dyed um, his hair to match that character's hair. And so he did that scene, which is just like, he's such a team player. He is. And if you don't know who Guillermo, Tor- uh, Guillermo Diaz is, he um, was in one of our earlier episodes, Half Baked. He And he also played Huck in Scandal. If you, if you, yes. if you know, you know. But he did the whole, the fuck you fuck you fuck you you're, you're cool. cool peace i'm out when he quit the burger place in half baked so that's who that is hmm. so moving back to christina ricci and company storyline casey affleck says i have to they invite them to package yes they invite them to the party he's like well first i have to deliver this package to tony we never see tony we never find out what's in the package but we have to deliver this package to Tony. It just looked like a brick of cocaine. Let's yeah. just call it a spade a spade. Well, and so in this scene, Gabby Hoffman's character is trying to leave. And Kristen Ricci's like, come on, like, let's just go with them. You wanted to be with musicians. And she's like, those <laughs> aren't musicians. <laughs> those are roadies. <laughs> and so then... Christina Ricci's character kind of drops the bomb that like, Hey, I didn't want to tell you, but the last train home left like an hour ago. To- Wrong so she- conka, my motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and so now Gabby Hoffman spiraling because they're stuck in the city overnight and blah, blah, blah. Which I mean, like if they had just gone to the cousin's party, I'm sure that was her plan the whole time. Like we'll just stay at her house right. and then go home the next day yeah you you don't fuck with those long island railroad trains that's for sure (laughs) you won't be stuck and so at this point at the end of the scene when gabby hoffman's character has kind of resided to the fact that she's gonna have to go with these dudes or spend her entire night on avenue b she just like (laughs) leans over to christina ricci and goes heroin (laughs) they're like leaving i was like and it does look like a brick of hair when you're not wrong. <laughs> so now we see all they may be in different clubs. All the clubs look the same to me, but it seems like they went to find Tony. But now Casey Affleck and Christina Ricci are just making out. Guillermo Diaz tries to kiss Gabby Hoffman's character. He is rejected. (laughs) And then Gabby Hoffman's character is very indignant and tells Christina Ricci, I can't believe you let him French you. (laughs) And then they're making out on the dance floor. And then Casey Affleck says, Tony left to meet uh, and said to meet him at a party. And now they're just dancing. And 
Gabby Hoffman's character is kind of wandering around the dance floor. And at first it kind of seems like she's panicking because she can't really find Christina Ricci. And then all of a sudden she like, she just resides herself to the fact like she's stuck in this situation, might as well have fun. So she starts dancing too. It's just pure rage at that point. <laughs> yeah. So now we're at a biker bar and Christina Ricci is making out with Camero Diaz's character <laughs> and Gabby Hoffman's just clutching her purse in the corner scared. And now and Casey. Scene, hmm? Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, and at the scene, um, there's two dudes just getting their head shaved at the bar. Like, yes. is that what happens at a biker bar? At certain skinhead biker bars, yes. Oh, I did not make that connection. <laughs> She had a right to be scared in the corner. Yes, 100%. And then in this scene, Casey Affleck's character is very confused and they kind of hurt him and Gabby Hoffman wander into this little area. I guess it <laughs> during the day, it's a place they fix cars. I don't know. Yeah, so Casey Affleck is like telling Gabby Hoffman how he's sad because he thought that Christina Ricci liked him and now he's making out with she's making out with Guillermo and he's just really confused and he still has the package for Tony and he thought quote that this is the one about Christina Ricci you just met her you stalker but then he continues with her big eyes and big round head no the part you forgot was like a little girl with the big eyes and big head, oh. which creeped me out. And then I said, well, I thought Fair. this was written by a woman. Why? But is she speaking to the fact that he's creepy? I don't know. I focused on the big round head because I have a big round head. So I felt like um, you were seen. I were, I was seen in that moment. Well, I don't then. have big giant eyes. My eyes are tiny, but I do have a big round head. <laughs> well, I'm glad you were seen. I was but seen I, in that moment. There's not enough big round head love in movies. So <laughs> take it when I can get it. I wish it didn't come from Casey Affleck, but yeah. um, so Gabby Hoffman, she's like, I'm just trying to get home before someone kills me. Like she is over the whole night. She's like, let's just get it over with so that I uh, can go back to where do they live? Ron Conk, I'm a bitch. <laughs> I knew I was never going to get that name right. So I'm glad you know it. (laughs) Yes, because the people who built out Long Island stole all the land Uh, from the indigenous people. A lot of the stops on the Long Island Railroad are of indigenous tribes names. Makes sense. So now we see them walking down the street. Guillermo Diaz is just passed out. He's had way too much to drink and probably other things that he has imbibed in. So they're kind of dragging him down the street or carrying him down the street. And they stop at like this little homeless encampment and there's a sofa there. So they just kind of put him on this random couch on the street. Yeah, which I was like, oh, the bed bugs, the lice. I was (sighs) so cringed at that. (laughs) There are gunshots fired. And at this point, <laughs> Gabby Hoss- Hoffman has just resided herself to the fact that she may end up dead tonight. She's just kind of like, <laughs> are those gunshots? And no one responds to her. And she just continues on in the conversation that they're having. They decide to get him into a cab, but no one has any money. And then, so Gabby Hoffman is starting to bitch more. And so Casey Affleck kind of puts in her place and he tells her, all you do is complain did you ever think you could have a good time if you just shut your mouth for five seconds and nothing is good enough for you? And so at this point, while this conversation is happening, Christina Ricci is digging through her purse, trying to find any money so that they can put Guillermo Guillermo, Guillermo Diaz in a cab and send him home. And she finds her cousin's address. So plans change real quick. They're just leaving him on the couch. <laughs> He'll find his way home. It's well, I'm sure his, um, it's so funny how he was just like forgiving of his friend 
Yeah. He broke bro code, but okay. And so they pretty much, they head to the party and we don't see them until the end. And we find out where everyone's been. Gabby Hoffman's character is passed out at Martha Plimpton's house. The girl who's having the the party, the cousin. And so she's the one who kind of tells everything that happens at the the party yeah Yeah. which we'll get to later yeah we'll save Casey and Christina's end of storyline because it involves some people we haven't met yet yeah so let's go back to the next storyline shall we let's do Kate Hudson and Jay Moore okay so many pages (laughs) so pretty much we meet Kate Hudson's character which is Cindy she comes out of this very nice apartment. I noticed there were a peeped, I believe, a, a doorman. She's wearing all pink, very cutesy. I, I love the outfit she's in. That coat. <laughs> that coat I is love that coat. That coat gives me flashbacks to the 80s of my childhood. <laughs> of like that the pattern. dress, not so much. I could totally leave the dress, but that coat, I just. I loved. I just have some problems with what she does. Her character annoyed me. She did a good job because the character annoyed the hell out of me. And, but I, that's because I don't like indecisive people. I saw what they were trying to do with the character. Yeah. I, I saw it, but at the same time, there were too many cliches thrown into one character. It wasn't believable. Yeah. Like all the other characters you could kind of like Courtney Love and Paul Rudd could have this really toxic relationship back and forth because they really did like each other. That's believable. And then like the two, what did you call them? Train and tunnel girls. (laughs) Bridge and tunnel. (laughs) Bridge and tunnel girls coming into the city and being really panicked and not knowing what they're doing. Like that was kind of believable too. I mean- Two of us stumbled into a, a leather club. It's it happens. <laughs> this storyline, these two characters, least believable out of all of them. Yeah, she's going on a first date because her character met Jay Moore. I guess the previous night or a night, two nights before. Who knows? They met at a party and she lost her virginity to him. So now, in her mind, she's trying to kind of set things back on course because mm-hmm. good girls don't do things that way, and a date makes more sense he's ready to take her but he gets bored or annoyed with her pretty quickly Mm. I don't judge him on that because he asks her pretty outright questions like hey do you want to go Go get a drink drink get a drink do you want to eat like she's if you want to it's very people pleasing and annoying they go to a pool hall oh they're at the bar uh, they're at the same bar that Ben Already Affleck. 40. Yeah. So the one that Ben Affleck's the bartender they they got drinks and they're about to play pool and she gets her anxiety so high. She gets all flustered and she like breaks the light over the, the pool table and she, she starts to freak the hell out. So she has to go into the bathroom and calm herself. And the things like the things that she does, it, You breaking shit i pulled my mic out sorry uh, i'm trying to find your notes yeah like well, if i feel oh here we go okay yes yeah she she breaks the light she not well she knocks over a drink onto the pool table and then trying to like grab the the drink she hits the light with the pool cue And so she, yeah. And you can tell like her exit strategy when she gets overwhelmed is to go to the bathroom to calm down. So she goes into this gnarly bar bathroom. Mm. The sink is clogged and full of like green gray water and cigarette butts. And so she's, she's just calming herself down. She's freshening up, but she goes to apply her lipstick and it breaks. She catches it, but she like smushes it to her dress So she's trying to like clean that shit up and she's just smearing it more, making more of a mess. And the thing I don't understand, like all of that is believable. Like that has happened to us. The thing I don't believe is that 
she reaches it because the rest of the lipstick falls into that gnarly water. I had to fast forward. I'm not watching and she, that. She reaches in to get it like that. That shit's gone. We abandoned that. There's still we don't have some lipstick. at the bottom of the tube. Use your finger. Like, why are we doing this? It's so disgusting. It's not needed. It's not like it would have made more sense if her earring yes. necklace, something she, valuable. Right. But not this lipstick. It no. was so disgusting. So disgusting. So then after that, she comes back and he's like, let's just go and get something to eat. They decide to go to this Indian restaurant and she tells him that, well, after they leave, actually, after they leave the bar, she tells him that she's never had sex before, like that their first, that she never does anything like she did the night before. And it was because she was a virgin. And all of a sudden this Per- perks him up, piques his interest. I and- wrote, he's too happy. Right. And he's like, what? Really? And he just wants to know why. And she gets so distracted by all of this other shit that's just happening in her world because she's so clumsy and crazy that she can't. Not really crazy. Think- she just seems she- like she has high anxiety. And like she just had a pretty big life event happen the night before. Fine, and is trying right. to like we're we're not shaming people for having... I'm not trying to shame her. She just irritated me because yes, her she was she I was annoying for it, and she was a caricature of someone who has high anxiety and probably struggles with social events. Yeah, she had a lot of spastic energy. I think that's really what was happening. Mm-hmm. So she is able to, it's just interesting to me how she, I guess maybe because she grew in that time frame, she really, really did like him because mm-hmm. as soon as she got triggered and gets mad at him later, she becomes pers- a real person. Her whole personality changes. Yeah. And that's what like, doesn't make any sense to me. I, so in Jay's, Jay Moore's excuses for why he's interested now that she has revealed that she was a virgin he says he's an actor and so he's really interested in people's motivations for things but then he also goes into a tirade about how this always happens to him Hmm. and as soon as he sleeps with someone apparently he has a magic dick and they just become digmatized and fall in love with him and I'm like, mm, not with that hair, Jay Moore. Not with that <laughs> hair. I, yeah, that was the other thing. I really wish they would have given his role, well, give it to somebody. Well, you know what? Having having skills in the bedroom t- doesn't have anything to do with your attractiveness. It's true. So I can't I can't shame that. And then she eats a really spicy pepper. And so she, she's gulping she water. And she stuff. thought it was okra in an Indian restaurant. <laughs> and he goes, okra's round. <laughs> like, <laughs> not wrong. So she, she hops up to run to the bathroom because she's kind of like a hot mess. She has rice all over her face. Her mascara is running. So she goes into the bathroom to kind of clean herself up. While she's in the bathroom, a group of <laughs> girls comes in and it's this, this lady is like, talking to Jay Moore and she's like, I thought you said you were out of town for the holidays. And he's like, oh yeah, well my flight got canceled or something. And she's like, or he said, I I was going on a ski trip and it got canceled. She's like, you thought you said you were flying to LA. He's like, oh, did I? And so it's like, apparently this is yeah, is to like, just not be honest with women, just lie to them. And I don't know, string them along. I don't know. It was, it was weird. So this group of women sits down to eat and now he panics because he doesn't want Kate Hudson's character to see the group of women. Are they like going to tell her? Right. I, do you think this is going well? I don't know why he was panicked. He was panicked as if they said, when that hoe gets out of the bathroom, we're going to beat her ass or something. Yeah. He was just being so weird and squirrely and there's one point where he goes to where to the bathroom and which is <laughs> in the kitchen. Yeah. And he's like, carry the hell up. And she's just like, oh, I mean, I mean, 
with and with toilet paper and she's washing dumping her face she's having a real anxiety attack yeah and he's just like get the fuck out of here because he's you know he thinks these girls are coming and pretty much she comes out and she just tells him that you know she's super nervous and it's because she really likes him and and this is when he pretty much says oh this always happens and She's, that's when it clicks for him for her that he is not a nice person and yes. um, the poor thing falls into pool of shit pretty much on the street yeah so she they walk outside out the back and so that's when she finally is like whatever dude like I'm leaving and at one point he does say watch the the street it's slippery or there's yeah. ice or something and so she goes and she slips on an ice patch and falls in a pile of dog shit. So now she has dog shit on her beautiful pink coat. Um, I thought set. he w- would have been a gentleman or nice person and said, here, take off your coat. Here's my coat. And, you know, it's extremely cold Yeah. at that time of the year. I'm surprised they didn't have more layers on, but it's a movie. I feel like they could have gone back in the restaurant and tried to like wash that off but she literally gets into the taxi and didn't even attempt to wipe it off she does take the tutu part of her dress off she could have used that to clean yeah the back like that drove me crazy why are you going into the cab and ruining other people's day she sits back in the seat in the cab oh yeah and he has the audacity to be like you want to share a cab and why does he have her purse and why is he he keep he has her purse and he's wearing it over his shoulder instead of giving it back to her she gets in the cab again how does he have the cab get paid because i see her giving him money but she doesn't have her purse so and you know back then there were no pockets in the dresses because there's still no pockets (laughs) there's barely any pockets So she does, before she does get into the taxi, she goes on a tirade of pretty much telling him about himself that he's looking at this whole situation of women falling in love with him as some sort of curse instead of looking at it as some sort of blessing or a good thing or for him, something for him to learn instead of trying to avoid and be like a a massive jackass. Yeah. Um, So she finally gets her cojones going and she's free. And... Do we see those two again until the end? Mm, no. So uh, that is kind of their story. Um, which we can tell the end of their story. So at the end of the story, we see Jay Moore's character wake up and he is with Christina Ricci's character, which is hilarious because she, he looks at her and he's like, oh my God, how old are you? And she's like... <laughs> There's this line she said that like, don't worry, I ain't gonna tell nobody or something. Yeah. Like that. And in June, you can come to prom with me. <laughs> and he's just like, oh, he and then she whispers, the yeah, she whispers, I love you. Which how many women are really? Who that? says that after the first? Like, maybe I don't care might. how inexperienced you are you're not saying it It you're not a dummy yeah yeah that's crazy and then kate hudson you see her with with casey affleck's character and they have matched up with each other which again speaking of the dog shit he doesn't say anything about like how does he not see it on her back first of all secondly how do you not smell that it's a good wad of it you should have been smelling that that whole time like how do you not smell that he doesn't say anything about it until they like hug and kiss which he too has now said that he's in love with her after this a few hours and during this scene romeo and juliet by dire straits plays obviously one of my favorite songs but Casey Affleck had mentioned to Kate Kate Hudson that it was one of his favorite love songs so she secretly convinced the director Risa Berman Garcia to play the song during Affleck and Hudson's final scene together as a surprise for him so he didn't find out until he watched the movie at the premiere which I thought that was really sweet of Kate Hudson yeah 
So let's go to, I just called them the two girls, the whole. (laughs) Nicole Ari Parker and Angela Featherstone. Yes. They are the epitome of a toxic friendship, especially a toxic female friendship. And you've seen it before where it's two girls who are quote unquote friends, but they are constantly in competition in competing with each other for for men and they do some real backhanded shit with each other we find them again at the bar where ben affleck is working and but they're not alone nicole parker ari's character or ari nicole ari parker sorry her character has a boyfriend and he is an irish bloke and eric, eric. I don't know who this man is. I've never I seen him know. after this movie. So he will use his character name his instead of his real name. name. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's kind of curmudgeon. Like, I don't, not, I don't want to say. He's just toast. He's just he's boring. Uh, vanilla. Yeah. And so it seems like they've been dating for a little bit of time, not too long. And we oh. see what they're com- they're arguing because he wants to he wants to take them both to the Martha Plimpton's party that she's throwing and she is his ex-girlfriend and they've been broken up for six months and so the faces and the shade and the side noises that Nicole Ari Parker gives in this movie I love them. <laughs> She does and this. I call her in my notes. I just call her veil girl. And then there's the redhead. Cause that, that, that little thing that she, the 1920, I don't even yeah. know if that's the twenties, but like thirties, it, maybe it's a fascinator is yeah. what it is. And she, she goes <laughs> like, she <laughs> do it again. She, <laughs> but she like purses her lips the way she does it it's it's so good I love her in this movie and you know what after when I was watching it before previously I don't think she stood out as much Mm -hmm. but now I'm like she's beautiful the nuances that she gives us you know and she's she's bougie Mm -hmm. she only (laughs) dates artists they both only date artists yeah. So that's why they're with this guy, Eric, is because he is an artist who paints giant vaginas. Yeah. The, the other girl calls them flowers. Flowers. I like your flowers. <laughs> He's like, what? Which is ironic because he does not know how to pleasure a woman Mm-mm. at all. It's why all his girlfriends break up with him. Yeah. Well, what? But we'll, we'll get into that in a a few minutes so while nicole ari parker is in the bathroom or like distracted angela is that her name angela Angela featherstone yeah angela hands him a pack of matches that secretly has her phone number (laughs) on the inside so she's trying to like steal him away from nicole but he leaves the matches on the table because they're all leaving the bar to go to the party so he thinks and that's when she's like I gotta break up with this dude because her and the friend have had all these conversations are like gotta get rid of him well they're in the bathroom and Nicole Ari says like he's bad in bed and then the friend's like oh shit I just gave him my phone number so she runs back to the the table and she's like do you have a light? Do you have a light? Do you have a light? And so he pulls out a lighter and she's like, no, I need matches. And so he like (laughs) hands her the book of matches she gave him. And so she gets her little book of matches back. And then, then they go outside and she breaks up with him and she tells him it's because her ex-boyfriend's back in the picture. And he's like, I thought he just disappeared. And she's like, oh no, but he called me yesterday. (laughs) So he disappeared after all this time. I think it was like six years or something and she just made up like a really lofty excuse and he calls her out on it but he leaves and they're like oh dodge a bullet (laughs) and they go back into the bar because that's when they start flirting with Ben Affleck's character and he tells them about 
the party, the party which is the same damn party that they yeah. were going to go And they're to. all they're all interested. And then they say this like you're going to have bad luck unless you go with, home with someone on New Year's Eve because there was this girl that didn't go home with someone and for 12 months <laughs> she she didn't have any dates or something like that. Like she, they had this weird superstition about well, a lot of people believe the way that you go into the new year is the way that your your year will be. That's why a lot of people clean their houses. You know, I don't know if everyone does this, but definitely in my family, you have to spend a lot of time cleaning before the new year comes. You have, your house has to be cleaned. So. so Eric leaves, we'll catch up with him again later. And are with Ben Affleck and he's, it's weird. Like, does he leave the bar and go take them to some, so another I, bar? I think they're arguing on the street and it may be when uh, Nicole Ari like goes to light her cigarette and sees that the matchbook had Angela's phone number in it. So they're kind of just arguing on the street. And I think Ben Affleck is like finished with his shift. So he comes outside and he sees them and they're like, oh, hey, hey. And he's like, let's go get <laughs> cocktails. And so they go to a cocktail bar and he reveals that he's in his third year of law school. They're immediately disinterested. <laughs> we don't want no yuppie. We want a fucking artist. Yeah. And I and guess they, they, they just assumed him. that because he was a bartender that he was like a starving artist type, but he starts like rambling, like, oh, I've never been on a date with two women, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, he, he has some pickup line about like, I love your clothes. They'll like look great on the floor of my bedroom. Oh, how do you then, like your eggs in the morning? <laughs> scrambled, scrambled or fertilized. Or fertilized. <laughs> Gross. So they very quickly abandon faces again that Nicole Ari Parker is making in this scene. It's like, <laughs> it's just, I can't even do them justice. So yeah, they leave him and they hide. So when he comes looking for them outside, he can't see them. And now this is the second time he's been left because when we were with Courtney Love's character, and her toxic nonsense with Paul Rudd. And he comes to get her that second time with the flowers. She's like, I'm with that bartender now. He's like, let's just go. And so they leave. And so the, he comes out. <laughs> he's left again. So he's been left by three women in one night. So he heads to the party. And then they also, they're like, oh, it's 11 o'clock. Let's just go to the party. And then uh, um, Ari, well, Nicole Ari is like, I'm just going to the party. I'm going to go meet up with Eric. And Angela's like, he's bad in bed and you just broke up with him. And she's like, well, at least I won't be starting the year alone, essentially. So they get in Dave Chappelle's cab and Dave Chappelle and Angela are like making eyeballs and winking <laughs> at each other in the rear view mirror. And so they're on their way to Martha party. Plimpton's party now. Yeah. And she does call her out and call calls out Angela mm -hmm. about you got to get a new stick with then using these matches. Mm -hmm. um, and then Dave Chappelle gives some weird fake wisdom to these girls about not, they shouldn't be fighting or competing with each other. So they decide that they're going to go to the party and they they're going to leave the party alone. Mm -hmm. Of course, these two bitches do not follow along with this. And so when we see how they fared, I love this scene so much. They call each other after you know, in the morning and they're like, oh yeah, so glad we decided to not have guys or whatever. But then in the bed, you see Ben Affleck with Nicole mm -hmm. <laughs> Parker. And then you see Dave Chappelle with Angela and, and they're happy to lie with the lie to each other. She's like handcuffed and shit. They were, oh yeah, they were doing some, yeah, Angela and Dave Chappelle were into some real they, some they were, they were probably about half an hour away from the chicken suit. <laughs> Yes, that this is our third Dave Chappelle movie. This is our third Janine Garofalo movie because we have done Half Baked, which they were both in together, and mm -hmm. Now and Then, which also had Janine Garofalo, Christina Ricci, 
and Gabby Hoffman as well. And she was also in, oh, <laughs> this one. <laughs> this is the third movie. So love of repeat, but this is our first Ben Affleck, Kate Hudson uh, uh, movie. Mm-hmm. Glad to have him. So let's visit Martha Plimpton, shall we? <laughs> I, the glue that holds this movie all together. Okay. Next so all I, the pieces. When I originally saw this movie, when I was younger, I was like, girl, take a chill pill. But now in my anxiety fueled adulthood and know what it's like to host a party, I 100% felt her in this. She's... Oh, and also just a side note before we we really dive deep in, <laughs> deep in, dive in. So Ben Affleck only signed on to this film because he believed it was going to support his brother Casey Affleck in his first leading role, which I did not think of Casey as being the lead in this movie at all. This is very much an ensemble piece, but he was surprised that with all the trades were talking about him signing on to the film in the headlines. So didn't didn't really help much, especially since it also bombed. So, and, and then did, as of 2021, this is the last film featuring both Ben Affleck and Casey Affleck as actors. They worked together on Gone Baby Gone, but Ben's contributions were writing and directing uh, completely off screen. Okay, Martha Plimpton, she is hosting a party. Like Danielle said, she has huge anxiety. She's worried no one's going to come. No one's going to like her crab dip because she made it off the <laughs> recipe on the box. She She's kind of just like ranting to herself and like how she hates parties and, but she's hosting a party. And at one point I'm like, is this bitch talking to herself? Because yes. you just see her like just touching everything in her and like tidying up and moving things from one table to another and stuff. But then you realize her friend Hillary is in the kitchen. <laughs> and, and she was talking to herself it's okay yeah I I was just like I are, are we are we just doing like some like expository dialogue here <laughs> but no she she actually had a person in her house and they're both sitting on the couch at one point and she's like what time is it what time is it and Hillary has a ring watch <laughs> so she keeps looking at it She's like, it's 8 30. I did not notice that. How did you not <laughs> notice the ring watch? <laughs> like, it's they show a close up of it, Danielle. <laughs> I didn't see it. So it's 8 30. And this is kind of a couple of other characters note the time, but this is kind of mostly we bounce back to the party to get t- time checks. So it's still relatively early in the evening for a New Year's Eve party at 8.30, but she's freaking out because no one's there, no one's showing up. And at nine o'clock, still nobody's coming. She, Hillary, not Hillary, Martha Plimpton says, is it too cool to be prompt? So I don't know what time (laughs) she planned this party for, but she was very indignant that people were not there in a timely fashion. Hillary is talking about how she's over Lenny, whoever Lenny is, her boo of the week or whatever. (laughs) And so then she's saying, well, I just need to hook up with someone, blah, blah, blah. And so Martha Plimpton kind of just says, anyone that walks through that door, you can have type thing. So we get the sense that Hillary is pretty boy crazy and is really willing to sleep with whoever walks through the door. (laughs) The next time we see them, it's 925. Hillary is asleep, like leaned over the back of the couch. She has a cigarette that's burned all the way down. Like it's just (laughs) ash and then the cigarette butt and she's snoring. And then this is when I noted her tiny tiara. It was very cute. Oh, it was a mess, but that tiara was cute. (laughs) That's when Hillary is like, I'm leaving and... Martha Plimpton's freaking out because it's her only guest. And now her only guest is leaving. And she's like, Hillary's like, no, but I'll be back later. And this is when she talks about her ex-boyfriend, Eric is coming. And if Hillary just stays that she'll make sure that she hooks up with him. And Hillary's like, okay, well, I'm still leaving, but now I'll actually come back. (laughs) They are toxic friends as well. So Martha Plimpton is watching 
love story alone in her apartment and it gets to that really famous scene that I don't know the quote to <laughs> and Martha Plimpton like throws like soup or something a drink at the tv screen and she's like lies you all lie she's like drunk as shit by herself at this point and she yells, I hate you motherfuckers. <laughs> and then there's a knock at the door and she's so excited. I have guests. She opens the door and it's Eric, the British guy. And he has just been rejected by his now ex-girlfriend. Nicole um, Parker. And so now he's complaining about his girlfriend breaking up with him. <sighs> this scene, Danielle, where she's like, we need Christmas music puts on Feliz Navidad <laughs> and does the weirdest fucking dance to Feliz Navidad. And I just love it so much. <laughs> I also love that she puts this man in his place to tell him that he, because he has all these excuses as, as to why women. He's so whiny. He's just like, why me? I'm like, first off, you're at your ex-girlfriend's apartment whining that your newer ex-girlfriend just broke up with you and you have the audacity to be like why me like what did I do yeah and so and I guess Martha Plimpton's reasoning for breaking up with him was I like you as a friend but not as a boyfriend like everyone is trying to let him down very gently instead of just being like you suck in bed Mm -hmm. Uh, but he keeps kind of pushing the issue and finally he's like I'm gonna leave unless you tell me the truth and she's so desperate for (laughs) to have a guest at her party that she says that you're the worst lover I've ever had in my life including high school damn Uh, yeah and so then he's starting to just take shots now and he's spiraling and he's trying to find any reason except you suck in bed as the reason why women are breaking up with him. Instead of being like, thank you for that criticism. I'll work on my form. He's just like, it must be y'all. Right. It's not me. Yeah. And then at one point he's like ready to, he's like, I'll show you. And he kisses her pretty passionately almost. So she's like, oh, but then her friend Hillary comes back and ruins the moment. And then Hillary's all over him and she just keeps getting more drunk and said, I'm not telling that bitch shit. But prior to this, prior to all of that, like you hear moaning and you're like, oh, are they like boning on the floor? And he's giving her a really weird head massage. And she's (laughs) like, you're hurting my skin. And he drops her head and it hits the ground hard. And then he blames her and says it's uh, with women it's all about emotion and intimacy and feelings and all of that vague ambiguous bullshit just be about sex (laughs) i'm sorry what (laughs) you were the problem sir gtfo don't eat my crab dip yeah you can leave now i don't know how she was even willing to kiss him so after all that, Hillary gets the brunt of that when he, you know, the when the party's over, we see mm-hmm. that she has been with him and she is ready to run out of his house. And he realizes it's happened again. <laughs> He's still yeah, she, she she makes vague excuses like, oh, I'm really busy. Maybe we'll meet up, maybe not. And like at first he does ask her, like, was it good? And she's like, oh yeah, it was great. But like, again, just like saving his feelings when really he's still terrible and he has learned nothing. Yeah. She finally does tell him too. Yeah. And he is at his wits end. But prior to this, while Eric and Hillary are talking, like you said, Martha Plimpton just starts like hammering shots (laughs) and passes out. So they throw her in her bedroom. And that's when the party kicks into high gear. So from this point on, (laughs) poor Martha Plimpton, who has waited around all night for anyone to show up at her party, misses out on all everything. Yes. So she wakes up, finds Gabby Hoffman, like we talked about earlier, and she just starts questioning her like, what do you mean? 
there was a party here because she sees her house as trash. The thing that really threw me for a loop is when she walks out of her bedroom, there is this huge scary dog and she stays very calm. I would have flipped my shit because that dog looked like he was going to bite her arm off or something. I thought you were going to go with when we're still in her bedroom up on top of, I think it's her mirror, her dresser mirror. There are just doll heads. No, I didn't see that. There are just doll heads and it is very (laughs) concerning. And then as she walks past the dog who happens to be a pit bull, we're not profiling dogs in this. He was was, just in there being a good boy. No, he wasn't. He does do a growl that I don't think he growls. He makes a noise. I know I didn't just, <laughs> he does look, he's not just like sitting there. He makes a noise. That's what scared me. He was just sitting there being a good boy. Uh, okay. Your white lady is showing right now. <laughs> <laughs> We're not profiling dogs. I don't it's even about know what kind trainer. of dog it is. You were the one who said it was a pit bull. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know. I just saw a dog that <laughs> growled and she just, she, cause it like something like, throws her back a little bit she's like I'll I'll watch again maybe I'm wrong but I believe there was some sort of ways made as she's walking past the dog there is like a seamstress bust I don't know what you call that like yeah Yeah. whatever you know what I'm talking about right and it has a doll head on top of it (laughs) I didn't see that either there are lots of doll heads in this scene but she's an artiste and when we go to I think it's Angela's bedroom with Dave Chappelle Mm -hmm. she has a lot of random Barbie doll parts all over like I somehow the aesthetic for being an artist is just deconstructing (laughs) dolls their parts and on random things I don't know is maybe it's for a metaphor of killing the idea fashion industry I don't know fashion standards I don't know either anyway Yes. So, oh, and she also has a fabulous beaded curtain that she walks through out of her (laughs) bedroom. There's lots of passed out people all over her floor. Yeah. The dog has a chain that's connected to some big guy on the floor. There's another person on the floor that like looks at her annoyed that she woke them up. Yeah. (laughs) And she starts talking to Gabby Hoffman. And Gabby Hoffman starts telling her everything that happened at the party, including the fact that Elvis Costello was there, but she didn't know the name, obviously. But Martha Pitt was slimmed. It it was the guy with funny glasses. Yeah. And he left his glasses and it looked like the glasses were in an ashtray. Why did she lick them? I had questions about that too, but I thought his glasses were in the crab dip. I was confused. Maybe I just missed saw, but even... Either that way, would've... that crab dip has been out since 8.30 the previous oh, evening. So gross. Yeah, it was unnecessary and weird. But yeah, she missed Elvis Costello, but she was very happy that everyone had a good time, even though she missed it. She didn't seem to be so mad about that. She was just glad that people loved her and she had friends. Yes, and then we see Janine Garofalo wake up and <laughs> we hear a voice say where are my glasses? Did I lose them again? And she realizes that she went home with Elvis Costello. Which is funny because in reality, Elvis Costello spent New Year's Eve in 1981 playing a concert with his band, The Attractions at New York's uh, Palladium Theater on East 14th Street, some blocks north of where 200 Cigarettes was taking place. Neat. So, yeah, and then the very end credits, Dave Chappelle kind of gives a synopsis of what happened that that evening. The only thing of note was the guy that kept making vaginas with his hands. I thought that was funny. Um, Yeah, but he makes a shorthand joke, which is to show what we are dealing with now, where he's like, there was the ugliest girl I've ever seen, but she was ugly. Because she was a man. Yeah. So I was just yes. like, oh, foreshadow. There it is. And the movie ends with his quote, if you relax, you can have a good time. Even if you smell like dog shit. And that's d- the end of the movie. <laughs> I think the movie ending is pretty much the hangover needs to give them like a credit because that's exactly how that happened too. Yep. With Polaroids and everything. 
And that, my friends, is 200 cigarettes. <laughs> we did it. Yay. I don't think we have a lot of little fun factoids that we missed. Uh, there was a story about that Christina Ricci said that while shooting in the East Village, the landlord of one of the buildings said she did not want the building to be shown the exterior because she was against smoking due to her father dying. And then she just did all sorts of sabotaging antics while she- I love a petty bitch. (laughs) Including hanging a no smoking sign in one of the windows covering the posts on the street with aluminum foil and singing row, row, row your boat during filming. She even almost punched out an extra for stepping onto the stoop during a shot, which walked towards the camera with the no smoking sign while singing. Yeah, New York for you. You know, Christina Ricci, Casey Affleck, and Kate Hudson had previously starred together in the indie comedy Desert Blue from 1998. And finally, Guillermo Diaz, who played Dave, was not a cigarette smoker and would often vomit after a lot of smoking on set. So Danielle, what is your current day rating of this? I kind of ruined it since I bought the DVD for both of us. So it still would buy it. You know, it was, I, I enjoyed it. I laughed out loud a few times. There wasn't anything too glaringly bad. It was good. How about you? Same would buy it, would buy it again. I I enjoy this movie every time I watch it. I I typically only watch it around this time of year. It's a good New Year's movie. It has just a great cast. And I like the dynamic between most of the characters. So, and my mom, shout out to Miss Terry. She is a Martha Plimpton stan. And so I think she was actually the one who rented this movie when it came out because it had Martha Plimpton in it. And so we watched it together for the first time. So love Miss Terry. She also introduced me to what's the one with Dolly Parton, uh, the best little whorehouse in Texas. Love it. And we also share Victor Victoria together. Yep. Yeah. She's great. Love Miss Terry. As usual, you guys can give us your feedback. If you've seen 200 cigarettes, have questions, disagree with us. That's just, that's just my grandma. We're going to, it's fine. We're just going to roll with it. You can reach us on our, our handles at no more late fees, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, and Jackie, how else can people reach out to give us feedback? You can call us at our quick drop number 909-601 and MLF 909-601-6653. And if you're international, you can leave us a message on Anchor FM. We'd love to hear from you. Give us feedback, suggest future movies, what you liked or disliked, corrections, blockbuster video stories, favorite moments. And remember, you can be featured on a future episode. And if you really love the show, Leave us a freaking review, guys. (laughs) Head on over to Apple Podcasts to leave us a five-star review. And this is a new feature. Spotify is letting you guys leave us five-star ratings. So help us out. Leave us a review or five-star rating on Spotify and Apple. And we will really appreciate it. And Spotify also has started doing... Uh, video. I don't know how to access it, but apparently there's a way to watch our videos. So uh, the episodes from Ocean's Eleven on are on the video as well as the audio are on Spotify. If you want to watch us instead of just listen and watch all of our crazy facial expressions (laughs) and Sometimes I put in uh, visuals, so yeah, it's fun. And if you don't have Spotify, you can also catch us on YouTube. So our episodes are there as well. Uh, and, <laughs> and if you'd like to support us in another way, head on over to patreon.com forward slash no more late fees and sign up to be a Patreon bestie. We have three different tiers. We have a VHS, a DVD and a Blu-ray tier, and they provide you exclusive content, stickers, ask me anything, polls, bonus videos, lives, and Spotify playlists that are based on my personal burn CDs of the late 90s and early aughts. Also, stay tuned for next week where we will be slicing and dicing our way through Scream 2. And as always, be kind and rewind. <laughs>